it's the, the book is narrated by a woman named Tessa. She is a, a, a very successful writer, a memoirist, a feminist. She feels really um, certain that she knows what it means to be a strong woman, um, a woman who is really committed to um, bringing herself forth in her work. And when we meet her, she has been engaged in a long distance correspondence with a philosopher named Charlie. He's based in Los Angeles. She's based on the East Coast. They each live with their respective spouses. And um, soon Charlie comes and stays with Tessa and her husband where they live in upstate New York on a farm. And um, Tessa's husband, Milton, excuses himself. Um, and, and I'm telling you this because basically uh, Tessa and Charlie, the philosopher, begin to talk and there are a series of conversations between them in the book where they um they talk about some of the i think the touchy subjects that we're thinking about today what do we mean by masculinity and femininity what about this issue of privilege what about cultural appropriation but the conversations between them aren't just intellectual they're also i think really charged um uh, even like sultry um, and Tessa finds herself um, feeling very, very drawn to Charlie. Um, and in spite of the fact that she really considers herself somebody who's a massive champion for women and an advocate for women in her work, um, when she meets Charlie's wife, Wa, she cannot help but feel really um, triggered, you might say, uh, envious of her, judgmental of her, um, all of her, the sort of thing we don't really talk about much, and I think in our culture, which is uh, the subject of rivalry between women, all of that is sort of activated in her. And so, uh, in, again, in spite of her politics, in spite of her desire to be a champion to women, she can't help but proceed to tear Wad down um, in her head and sometimes out loud. Um, so Tessa is a person who is, I think, really good at articulating herself and actually perhaps admirably um, in some ways self-aware and actually privately pretty good at admitting her flaws to herself and by extension us. But on the other hand, her certitude about everything even about herself, her and 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 such things as what it means to be a good person, a strong woman, um, etc. Her certitude, in a way, forbids her, I think, from um, allowing herself to imagine her way into radically other perspectives or radically other ideas about those very things that she's so certain about. So. But that's well yeah. said. That's well said. I think that maybe this is why in reading this book and in reading Tessa's narration, I found myself like, there's just like an, un, it's like a hard to define uneasiness. And I would compare it to the effect that uh, I feel when I read Camus, the stranger, which factors in, I think at least somewhat to this book, Camus certainly does. And maybe it's that, maybe it's that really cool intelligence and that self-awareness. And yet there, there's something cold about it. <laughs> there's something mm -hmm. cold about the intelligence, you know, and maybe it's that inability to imagine the perspective of others fully because of the certitude that Tessa feels about her own mm -hmm. viewpoint. Yeah. Well, Camus, I mean, one of the reasons I was, drawn to including Camus, in addition to the fact that I have long loved his fiction, but also his, um, his writing, his philosophical writings and his journal writings, um, is that I'm really, I've been really kind of um, moved by his ideas about love on the one hand and justice and morality on the other. And at the end of the day, Camus came down on the side of love. And what I mean is that, um, 
you know, you might know that around the time that he won the Nobel, he was really can't basically canceled by his some of his closest friends, Simone de Beauvoir, Sartre, because he was considered a political moderate. He wasn't for him lives and and people being al alive was more important than um, a commitment to communism or to his to social ideals. Um, so he he really, especially toward the end of his, you know, as he developed um, as a thinker, was really taken increasingly by um, uh, by even at the end of his life, he, he wrote in his journals, no more morality, no more morality, because I think he worried about the cost of a sort of inflexible morality and justice of the human cost, the heart cost. Yeah. So do you read a lot of philosophy or is it just Camus? Like, are you somebody who re it feels like you, you're really interested in this, at least for the purposes of writing this novel and these characters? You know, I think from pretty early on, I've been interested in philosophy for most of my, my intellectual life and in, starting in college, but I'm not a philosopher. Um, I, um, I have the benefit of being married to someone who's quite engaged in philosophy, which I'm sure, so that means it's ever present in the household. Um, but for this, I think what prompted me also in part to want to bring some philosophers into the book almost as characters, those two philosophers being Camus and Nietzsche, was that I was thinking a lot about as I was thinking about the book and, and the, the book's themes, I was thinking about this question that, you know, we ask ourselves sometimes, um, uh, especially lately. Um, what is the value of a work? And should we keep reading a work of literature, philosophy? You know, you know what I mean? Um, if the person who's written it has done things that we now deem kind of unforgivable. Um, so in the case of Camus, he was a pretty notorious womanizer, really hurt his family because of this. Uh, I also have the character of Nietzsche, um, and the, and the work of Nietzsche lightly in the book as well. And, and Nietzsche is often, you know, thought of as sexist or even misogynist. Um, and I think it's easy to argue he was sort of sexist. Um, and so could I have these two men in the book that's a book ab about, to some extent, women and, and what it means to be a strong woman, and at the same time um, draw out some value, the value of their work to me as a writer? Um, so, I mean, again, there's this, there's this little vignette in the book where um, it's uh, Nietzsche in real life. Nietzsche went to a friend's home and um, this friend, it was a, a couple, the woman um, broke down and cried about having lost her faith in Christianity. And um, Nietzsche begged her not to renounce her faith because for him, on the one hand, there's the truth of something and on the other, there's the value of it. So even if we might encounter a hard truth about something, let's say someone in a marriage, does that mean throwing away the whole value of the marriage or a political figure? We find out a truth about a political figure who may be doing valuable things. Do we just throw out the baby with the bathwater? Um, so again, Nietzsche's thinking about truth on the one hand and value on the other and his unwillingness to his sort of belief that even though he was writing philosophy in pursuit of truth, truth wasn't the more important to him than value or values. I, I feel like we live in a time where people, or a lot of people do tend to want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It seems like this really binary, like a time of binary thinking, right? I'm sure you felt this. Is this kind of something that you were responding to in the writing of completely, this book? Completely, completely. Um, you know, I, I was taking notes for the book. Um, I started taking notes. So my last book came out in 2017. And right around that time, I entered 
so first of all, sort of, you know what was going on then in our world. Um, me too being one of the things that was really, really happening. And it so happened that for me personally at that time, um, it was a, a time of, of, of upheaval in my life. Um, uh, I had a very, we bought our house in 2017, six months later, um, the house next door burned down and caught our house on fire. And we spent, um, the next two years displaced, moving around LA, trying to just rebuild this house. Also our marriage was, we've been together for 26 years and it was the hardest two years of our, our marriage. And even, um, for a period of time, we weren't living together. And so I was really thinking about the value of the nest, literally rebuilding our nest, um, putting everything I had into um, restoring it, making it safe, making it aesthetic. Um, but at the same time being like, whoa, what is the um, the value of that nest now? Um, thinking about men and women, mothering and fathering, you know, gender roles, all against this backdrop of me too. And at the same time, I went to like six different therapists to try to find one that I liked. And every single one of them told me a version of the same thing, which was um, when I kind of described what was going on. Um, basically, they, what I heard again and again was you're being, it's time for you to focus on you. It's all about you. Don't be a martyr. Um, don't be that sort of stereotype of the feminine martyr who is holding up the world as everything falls apart um, and neglecting yourself. And I, I sort of entered a phase of, I think, like a battle in myself between, and, and again, Me Too was going on, and that was sort of the, the background noise. But the battle being like, again, sort of truth versus value. Well, it may be true that I was in a phase of holding up the world of my own little nest did that mean that I should sort of burn down the marriage along with, and the family unit along with um, uh, my house um, just because maybe things weren't fair in the moment? Um, was there not another kind of strength that I, that was a sort of a, I think a noble strength and being able to do that? Um, what if I got past my, kind of correct ideas of how to be a strong woman and how to assert myself and instead valued, I think, some more stereotypically feminine things that um, we tend to almost in a weirdly displaced mis misogynistic way belittle, like a woman's capacity to nurture, to be devoted during times of difficulty or other times. Why, or is, why was all that being denigrated? Why, why was that being belittled? For me personally, um, may, may, can I interrupt you? Because I have yeah. a question about this. I think obviously there's the male, female bin uh, binary, and the ways in which men, for whom strength and uh, you know whatever, gets projected onto men. You know these are the things that we're supposed to embody. I could see how men might belittle a woman's ability to nurture and maybe characterize that as weakness somehow. Is it also the case that you feel like there were negative messages about that sort of thing coming from women too? Or was it more, do you know what I'm saying? Like what the yeah, culture tells I, us about I these things. I absolutely know what you're saying. I, I would say yes. I, I, I think that, so that what I just said about the, the, these therapists, they were all six women and they were all really genuinely, I think, trying to help me. But the basic message was, I mean, one even said to me, you're not going to like this, but I think you're submissive. And maybe she's right. But, um, but I also, it reminded me of the ways in my life I had been told, um, you need to be more assertive. You need to be, you need to prioritize, um, your profession as much as you do your family. Otherwise you're sort of a bad feminist or you're, um, you're not advocating for yourself sufficiently. And, so, you know, there's this, the, the book starts with one woman accusing another woman, Tessa accusing Wa, the other character, of being an insult to women. And, and, and that allegation came, really came out of, for me, a lifetime of 
of being conflicted about all of this, you know, um, and being torn myself about my kind of divided commitments and, and separate ideas of what I want and, uh, and what I think I'm good at as a woman. Let's have you read from okay. the novel so that listeners can get a sense of the voice on the page and can get a sense of this central conflict in the book between Tessa and Wa, these two women who have intersecting lives that are described in the novel. Okay. When I accused Wa of being an insult to women, an insult to womankind was my unfortunate phrase. We were sitting with our husbands at a fashionable rooftop restaurant in downtown Los Angeles. It was late. I'd made the mistake of starting in on a third martini. And straight away, I could feel the husbands begin to cower, whereas Wa confronted me with a look of hurt, almost to tell me that I betrayed some sort of feminine understanding. You've misunderstood me, Tessa, she said, and I noticed that she was panting as though I'd shaken her physically. She cast around for help from her husband, Charlie, whose steady gray eyes were moving between us. I think not, I said, before he could save her. But of course, she had a point. I'd never been able to read Wa, and I still don't believe that it was a matter merely of culture or ethnicity. True, as our current ethos would have it, she was a person of mixed race, something that might have contributed, beyond her unusual look, to the confusion of her submissive and queen-like demeanor. Though I don't think even her relatives could have told you if her general mode of quietness was due to a timidity on her part or a righteousness that kept her at a remove from others. I don't think anyone knew if she tended to smile courteously during conversations with that supple mouth of hers because she was incapable of keeping pace with our ideas or privately counting the ways those ideas were imbecilic. What I'm trying to get at is that I found her to be a tangle of both deference and hostility, if also some beauty, which is why, before the restaurant incident and my unfortunately phrased accusation, I was sympathetic when Charlie suggested he wanted to leave her. Okay, so based on what you were saying before the, you read that passage about being female, the messages that um, are often sent out to women about what that means or what that is supposed to mean. Is it a fair assessment to say that in creating Tessa and Wa and the relationship depicted in this novel that you were using them as kind of polarities or a way to explore this stuff from different perspectives? I mean, that's what's happening here. It's kind of giving you a chance to pit these conflicting ideas against one another. Yes, I mean, we are... So I intentionally wrote in Tessa's perspective because I think superficially she is more different from me than Wa, meaning Wa's mixed race Asian. She lives in Los Angeles. Um, she lives in a neighborhood more like mine. Um, it would be pretty easy for readers, you know, doing a quick internet search to say, oh, well, the author's more like Wa. So I was interested in and maybe we can talk about this later, but 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 part of the theme of the book, one of the themes in the book is 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 this idea of perspectivism, and we can get to that in a minute. But I wanted to imagine my way into a perspective of a woman whose idea of how to be, how to be in family, how to be with children, how to be with a spouse, and how to be a professional, a, a, a professional writer was a bit different from mine. Um I think that because we never get access for the most part to Wa's interior life, it's easy to read them for a very long time in the book as polar opposites, as having a very different ideas about those things I just mentioned. That begins to break down, I think, as Tessa mm, reckons with all of this. And as we learn, we kind of gain access to some of Wa's inner thoughts. You know, one of the things that struck me about the book and about Tessa's 
perspective in particular because it's it's right there you know her like you say her inner life is depicted on the page has to do with motherhood parenthood i think reading this as a father and reading about the ways in which she has this kind of distant relationship with her daughter nora or at least more distance than i think i have with my kids i think maybe like she's a cat and I'm a dog <laughs> would be like one way of putting it. Cause she's got this coolness and I'm just like, Hey, you know, and like, I, so mm -hmm. I found myself just going, Oh my God, is this like, this is a way of doing it. Like you could be a parent like this and not be so like over the moon about your kids or like constantly wanting to be with them or, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it just, it made me think about my own life and other parents that I know and how like maybe to a degree that I haven't, recognized there are people who aren't like into it in the way that I am or who, who do it differently. And it unnerved me a little bit, if I'm being honest, to have to think about it that way, you know, how she, like, what was that? There's a, she's at that seminar or like that's a, she's giving a speech and talking about like the possibility of losing a child, like the death of a child. And she gives this answer that would just chill me, <laughs> you know, yeah. where she's not, I mean, that's like every parent's worst nightmare, right? That's what we always are, are kind of taught to think of it. And it's pretty natural, but maybe not for her. So well, I don't know. I think that this is a case where what you're referring to in this, in this, um, I guess, colloquium or, or, or panel discussion on motherhood and justice at Columbia University that her daughter, Nora, has put together. Um, and she makes this statement that you're referring to. It's in this particular case, it's an instance, I think, of Tessa valuing justice and correctness and morality over love. I think the reality is deep down inside, Tessa is passion loves her daughter so much, but she is so wedded to she has such strong allegiance to her sense of what's right and it gets in the way of her heart and so um yeah if that makes sense it does it does i'm a dog too by the way <laughs> when it comes to parenting. yeah i mean like I, you know it's but it's a credit to you and the way that you how, like how sharply you drew these characters that it had this effect on me. And then I think also there's the, the, the philosophical subtext or what do you call it? You know, there's like this, it's part of the undergirding of the story is this philo philosophical conversation between Tessa and Charlie and these debates between love and morality, or, you know, I get, there might be other ways or other binaries at play here, but I found myself like working to keep up and it made me think it made me see the world differently you know what i'm saying it forced me into confrontation with like these ideas and i appreciated that about it but it also you know at times just made me think like oh god maybe it just destabilized me you know i think maybe we get we get into our little train of thought and our little fixed way of going through the world and Every once in a while, you'll read something and it will knock you off your, your course a little bit. And that's good. Uh, but I did, I have to say, I did worry. I worried about Nora, <laughs> uh, okay. you know, a little bit. I found myself worried about her. Nora being Tessa's daughter, who is, has in some ways or in many ways been neglected. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also not like overindulged in the way that so many kids are, you yeah. know, she's been kind of treated as a human being, or I don't know, maybe that's not the way to put it, but treated as maybe an adult, probably too, a little bit too early, you know, in her life. Mm -hmm. But there's a certain toughness that maybe she might have that kids who are over nurtured might not have. Right, right. You know, one of the things that happened in my personal life when I was also putting together these ideas was I, um, I, I had a little magazine assignment to write a piece um, 
that took place in Lisbon. And it was the kind of assignment where they didn't tell me where I was going until 24 hours before. And um, so I had no plans. Suddenly I was like on a plane to Lisbon. And um, I had a series of unexpected, completely unplanned um, meetings with people there. You know, I, I, I suddenly when I was on the ground, I reached out to someone who might know someone who put me in touch with this person. I, and suddenly I was meeting, it just so happened, about five different men who were writers and or scholars um, to, to, because I decided what I was going to write about. And they all had something to do with that. And I, I'm not, without saying too much, <laughs> giving away too much, but literally almost in every case, the man would say something like, yeah, my children mean so much to me. And through the course of the conversation, I would find out that their children were living in another country <laughs> and were young still. Uh -huh. And they had this conception of themselves as um, very engaged parents. But in fact, they hardly ever saw their children. And it really got under my skin. And I, I started thinking like, could, like, what a what? I mean, is this some? I'm mean, apparently not you, Brad. But I think that if I'm going to sort of speak in and stereotypes and generalizations, I feel like this is a lot more natural for a man to think this way. Like I'm a very engaged parent, but like in reality, how much time am I really spending with my children? And it would actually be okay to even live in another country. I'd still conceive of myself as a loving, attentive, and engaged parent. But what if, like, are do we accept that more from a man than we would from a woman? Did part of why it like upset you and worry you so much is because Tess is a woman. Would it not have worried you so much if she were a man? I wonder. I think if I'm being honest, that the effect is probably sharper in some subconscious way because she was a woman or she is mm -hmm. a woman on the page. It wasn't something I was thinking about. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like I was like, oh, she's a woman. She's a mother. She's supposed to be doing X, Y, and Z. But I would cop to that. I think maybe the way that we've been enculturated or Mm -hmm. you know, that there's some of that. But I think if it were a man, I would have felt it too and would have been measuring my own tendencies. Now I say that, and I, as a parent, uh, see my kids a lot, mm -hmm. but I work a lot too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes feel like I'm not seeing them enough. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I you know, I don't want to sound like super dad or something. I'm just around a lot. I work from home a lot. So, you know, but I have to be focused on work a lot of the time mm -hmm. and there are questions around that i think most parents have to navigate that that seems fairly fairly normal but i i don't know i just uh i guess the answer to your, your question is yeah i think probably there's some of that some of that has to do with gender but mm -hmm. i still also reacted in just a general way as a parent and had to think about like maybe I'm too indulgent or maybe I'm too soft. <laughs> like there's a toughness to Tess and like a, a sharpness to her intellect that kind of intimidated me a little bit and made mm -hmm. me question what I was up to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe like, I think you were kind of exploring it for yourself in maybe a similar way, like just Absolutely. to try to measure, measure sure. yourself against her. Right. Absolutely. I mean, she's hyper successful. <laughs> she's, very productive, very prolific in a way that, frankly, like, I just haven't been because my commitments have been have been more toward parenthood. I mean, my my older daughter just turned 18, my younger one just turned 16. So I'm, I think I'm just sort of seeing on the other the other side of the intense years of parenting, but it's always been my my number one thing since I've had children. And, but I've lost something because of that. And I have wondered, actually, also if they have as well a little bit. I think that you know, I am a I am a professor and um, a writer, and and so they they have seen they they think of me as a professional woman, but um, I think that by the time I was their age, I mean, especially the, I think the eighteen year olds launched now, but just they're less independent, they do less for themselves than I did. Um, it's easy to sort of lean on me because I've been there. And so, um, 
yeah, it's just, I feel like we're doomed to fail <laughs> in this negotiation between caretaking and, and so, you know, realizing ourselves. I think about this. So generationally, you and I are pretty close. Like, I guess I'm Gen X or late Gen X or something. But I think to my childhood, and basically I was just like out and about from a young age on my bike, riding all over town. I would come home for dinner. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like that sort of thing mm -hmm. is unthinkable. I get it that I, you know, I'm raising my children in Los Angeles as you are, but it's just different. And I sometimes can find myself like bristling and being like these kids today, you know, that old person thing <laughs> where you're like, these kids today are just not, they're not as tough, but maybe it's just different. Like, and I also will worry, like, am I doing it wrong as a parent? You know, what should I be doing to help my kids out the most? And it's a, such an impossible question. I don't know what the answer is. What, I don't what think are we any of us to do, but it's great that you're asking the question. Yeah. <laughs> right. What are we supposed to do? You know, what are we supposed to do? I don't know. Yeah. Most of the time. I mean, I think that you're expressing what to, to revert to, to gender stereotypes again, but I think a lot of women are, who are professionals and mothers are constantly feeling this, this failure, you know, and, 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 and they're, and like, I have no idea. I, I haven't cracked the code. <laughs> well, let me know if you do, maybe okay. somebody out there has, but I just, and then even though I will have these questions, even though I can find myself like hand wringing a little bit uh, when I think about it too much, if somebody presents themselves in my social media feed or, you know, whatever it is as being an expert, I bristle against that too. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I, I'm like suspicious of advice and yet hungry for it. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially when completely all that, you know, I, I've never been a guy who like read books about how to be a dad. Maybe I should have, you know, like the instruction manuals. I was always like, no, like human beings have been doing this for millennia. <laughs> you know, like I, I'm, I'm biologically wired for this. I'm going to sort it out. Maybe that was a mistake, but. Well, I think that your resistance to, um, to like expertise or certitude of any kind with respect to parenthood and your willingness to cop to your, um, the confusion <laughs> about how to do it is, is, is the only admirable course in my opinion, because it's, it's real, it's honest. It's allowing for the mess of life and, and also the mess of like the individual circumstance, you know? Yeah. And I think I'm, I am a person who lives eternally in like what I call the gray zone. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when it comes to me, maybe it was Tessa's certitude, you know, and this feeling that she's really got her brain wrapped around things. Mm -hmm. I don't have that. I never have my head. I feel like wrapped around things. And Maybe in my least admirable moments, I do have that feeling. And I always come to regret it. Like if I give a strong take, like as an example on social media, I'm almost always deleting that within 24 hours because I will second guess myself. I will go, what am I, you know, I'll almost immediately disagree with myself. And yep. I, I run up against this, whether it's a question around, let's say a me too cancellation. Mm -hmm. Or it could be anything, but that's just, you know, you, you brought it up earlier and that's kind of, um, I don't know, hinted at in the book and uh, is part of what fueled you. It could be something like that. Uh, or like Dave Chappelle or, you know, anything that comes across my screen and I'm suddenly forced to be like a moral arbiter, <laughs> you know, and to figure out what I think and like, how do I come down? What's my verdict? I struggle. I struggle so much to feel a sense of authentic conviction one way or another, because I can argue it both ways to myself. And I'm never, I'm, I'm rarely left with a clean answer. That is why I love the form of, of fiction as a writer, because it's a form that I feel allows me, allows other writers to go for it. Um, try on perspectives, try on ideas that can come into collision with one another. Um, it's sort of like creating like a space of 
provocation and contestation that's 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 safe to an extent because it's make believe and right. there's different characters and it's not me it's not charmaine committing to something um because i i like you i'm much more interested in looking at sort of the the complexity of something rather than like making a, a proclamation about my opinion about it, which is why I don't really do social media. I think I would die of anxiety if I tried to do that. And it would just feel fake to me. Yeah, I know. I'm like now at the stage where I left it for a long time, but then I feel an obligation to use it for this show, which feels okay to me. Mm -hmm. But as long, mm -hmm. I think I'm just limiting myself to like posts about the show, sharing news about books. Like that's it. But that I'm not like as soon as I start, like I tried to, I tried once to do one of these videos. It was like when my book came out, I was like, I guess people are like talking to their phones. And like, I almost died. I deleted it almost <laughs> immediately. I would I, too. I cannot. Do, I was like, I feel like a complete fraud or just like it felt so gross to me. And it's just not for me to each their own. But I could not do it. And I, the physical feeling of discomfort was extreme. And yet I can do, I can do this. I can talk to you all day about your book and about, you know, these ideas and stuff, but I just couldn't do the, the, the self performance or something, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to my phone. <laughs> um, so let's talk about um, female relationships and female rivalry. You mentioned this earlier and I know we've been kind of talking around it, but I think this is an interesting part of the human experience and something that I've, been witness to in my life but i'm always sort of peripheral as a guy i'm like never really in it you know the yeah. way that women can be in it and tessa and wa have a mutual rivalry it's not just like tessa feels wa as a threat wa also feels something similar about uh tessa so you just talk a little bit about your feelings on that and how you drew on maybe real life to draw the rivalry that we see on the page. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned this before. I th rivalry between women is one of those subjects that I think culturally we're more comfortable referring to it as, oh yeah, that mean girl phenomenon or, you know, cat fight um, as if it's sort of just like out there, bad people. Um, the reality is I think most women would agree um, from a very early age, I mean, just look at little girls and you have a daughter, um, how easy it is for girls to feel hurt by one another and how easy it is for power dynamics to sort of happen. Even again, at, on the, at the playground, third, fourth, fifth grade, it starts. Um, girls are almost groomed to, or wired, I don't know which, maybe both to, be really sensitive to one another. Um, does she think I'm wearing the right thing? Am I too attractive? Does she feel threatened by me? Does um, does she think I'm too um, too unpopular? Um, am I trying too hard? Am I? There's all these little dynamics that every woman I've talked to about this is like, oh, yeah. It's so oppressive. It's so oppressive. It's so pervasive. And we can be like, have our best relationships in our lives be with other women, close friendships, completely supportive of one another. And yet this thing is some, a thing that is ever present as you're sort of negotiating new relationships with women or a school environment or, and so, you know, as I think that I was really probably also partly thinking about me too and thinking about some of the statements people made such as well if women were control of in control of you know this corporation this would never happen or if women were in control of whatever it may be you know they would never do this to other women and i and i was like again that's one of those black and white statements that is just i don't buy it it's just not my experience i, I just think that if we really want to help women um continue to advance in every way we need to be a little more honest in my opinion about some of the ways that women 
have historically, for whatever reason, and some re- sort of almost had um, either, yeah, competed with one another, hurt one another, or even um, absorbed some, what I would say is misogynist ideas about, in this culture, like what's valuable as a woman, you know? And this is also what I was trying to get at, that, you know, Tessa's sort of very disparaging of um, prettiness or um, femininity or softness or or devotedness to, mater- you know, a, a child or a, a marriage. Or, or, or even she's disparaging of compassion, empathy, forgiveness. Yeah. And the guys... Meanwhile, we have Milton, who I think we have not talked about yet, who is Tessa's husband, and Charlie, who is Waz's husband, and who is having a kind of emotional affair, I guess you could say, with Tessa, and also to some degree with Milton. Like they, <laughs> he's in a relationship with both of them. You know, yes. like he is their friend, and and to a degree that Wa is not. And yeah. I have to say, one thing that your book made me think about too, I was like, wow, they really do like host each other and have like sleepovers a lot. Like they stay in each other's houses. I'm like, I haven't done enough of that. I, no one invites me over, <laughs> you know, but me they neither. travel. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, come on over, come to the farm, stay with us, eat dinner. We're going to, it's like this lovely, like, I think I I'm sort of uh, wishing that we're more the case. But can I ask you a question? Yeah. Total, just, just, just curious. You just referred to it as an emotional affair with Tessa and Milton so are, do you think that, um, did you feel that, like, would you have felt, did you feel that way just because it was only Charlie who was involved and not Wa? Would you feel that way if someone only invited you and not your spouse? Would I feel that I was in an emotional affair? Yes, with a couple, with another couple. <laughs> I think like, it, it depends. It, it's all contextual. Like it depends what the content of our exchanges were, the intensity of the friendship, what was happening between me and the the woman, me and the man and the, you know, in their marriage, you know, I would have to kind of measure. I see. I would have to measure it, but it would strike me maybe as a little bit odd if consistently, uh, you know, a one-off mm-hmm. is one thing, but if I was consistently being invited to hang out with them absent my spouse, mm-hmm. you would have to take into account like, wow, they seem to be into me <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> to a, to a degree that they're not into, into my spouse, you know, right. but um, it's an interesting, it's interesting to, read their interactions and to kind of watch this unfold and to see the way that it evolves in the presence of and in the absence of Wa, who even when she's not there physically is always there, you know, mm-hmm. in spirit and intellectually, right? I mean, mm-hmm. she's, she's always a serious part of the equation for Tessa as she narrates. Yeah, I think part of that is because... Um... Tessa can't pin down Charlie's own allegiance to Wa. You know, I think that that is a sort of slippery subject that Tessa can't, she can't quite get her bearings. And so Wa is an unknown quantity that is, um, that holds a certain, she holds a certain power, even even in, in her absence. And also there is the issue, I mean, we touched on Tessa's approach to motherhood and this kind of distant relationship that she has with her daughter, Nora, and this kind of, it's like, I mean, the emotion is there. Like you say, it's buried, like deep down, she really feels a lot of love for her daughter, but she's not as emotional or as like puppy dog-ish about it as maybe I am or you are. And then you have uh, Wa, who has an adopted daughter, I believe the pronunciation is Tet. Is that the Correct. name? Correct, yes. Yeah. yeah. And she's like an orphan, a Burmese orphan, I think, who was adopted from like a convent in Kuala Lumpur. Do I have the details right? Am I remember remembering correctly? Correct, yes. Okay, so mm-hmm. she adopted a girl who uh, comes from very difficult circumstances and is, I think, representative of a more nurturing approach to motherhood and a more sacrificial approach, if that's a way of putting it. Mm-hmm. I think and it's exactly the way to put it. Not everybody's going to be uh, approaching parenthood the same way, but I feel like maybe Tessa has a hard time accepting that. 
Well, I think that for Tessa, what is implied, I hope, is that the more certain she is, that she, the more she tells herself that she's been justified in the choices she's made, in her not, as she puts it, hanging herself by the rope of self-sacrifice when it comes to parenthood, <laughs> the more entrenched she is in that position, the more it belies as or suggests a certain insecurity with respect to that position. And I think what is suggested, I hope, is that her upset over was doing the opposite, um, sacrificing her career for the sake or her writing time for the sake of her child, etc. cetera, um, that, that that upset, again, really just throws the mirror back at herself. That it, that it shows the extent to which she has a conflictedness that she's never wanted to really look at about all of this and a guilt, I think. I, I didn't mean to suggest that, oh, Tessa's wrong in, in, in the choices she's made and, and see, she's guilty, but, but rather that actually if she's wrong, it's only in her certitude and in her judgment. You know, that might be like the, like a, a, that's like a gradation difference to me between Tessa and the narrator in The Stranger and Mersoul. Obviously different characters. One is, you know, they're, they're very different. But I did feel just in the delivery a similar effect. Hmm. Uh, and I, I sat there reading the book and like endlessly trying to figure out what it was about the delivery, like word choices, the character construction, coolness of intellect. There's something about the certitude of Tessa and the certitude of Merceau, mm -hmm. with the exception, and this is what I'm pointing to, that maybe Tessa is a little bit, uh, or is more self-aware of her weakness, and there is more room in her for remorse and being wrong or emotional upset. Merceau mm -hmm. feels like, Teflon, you know, like yeah. there's just like nothing Agreed. there, you yes. know, but I think that there are people that you come across in life, not in an extreme case like Merceau, but people that I've come across in life who do have just a, a tougher, colder's a word for it, but it's not like, a, I'm not trying to place a value judgment on it. I just mean like more cat-like. <laughs> I have such like a lack of language to describe this. You mean that there's not sort of the, um, the, the internal conflict going on all the time. And, yeah. and so there's, it's, or at least no access to that internal conflict. They just seem like what I will tell myself, this is a conversation for eventually my eventual therapist is, uh, I will tell myself like, A, they're better at life than I am or B, the world is made for people like this. Yeah. Like, because they can make decisions more easily or they feel this sense of self-assuredness and they can process things more quickly. You know what I'm saying? Like, whereas I'm sitting there going, oh, I'm constantly in this state of back and forth and living in the gray zone or in a state of emotional upset or empathy or anxiety, whatever it is, you know, because I'm, I don't know, I'm responsive to other people's situations or how I perceive them. Like my antenna's up for that stuff. Do you get, mm -hmm. see what I'm getting at? It's just, 100%. these are just. percent. Yeah. And I think antenna is exactly the way to put it that, um, and that's one of the things I love about fiction too, is that it's all about that like acute perceptivity, you know, whether it's first person or close third, when we're rendering a scene, rendering a moment, we're rendering it through the mechanism of a person with antennae and who are picking, who is picking up on signals that are um, not necessarily verbal, um, not necessarily even like facial expressions, um, but like in the ether and, and obviously drawing on their past and experience and their, their projections of, of, of anxiety about the future and all sorts of other things. There's a density of perception and feeling that is spectacularly human 
and I just want to say, like, I would imagine that even though it's hard to live in, in, in the way that you were just describing, it's also like living instead of just like being a robot. Yeah. And I think I worry that maybe the world is designed for robots <laughs> or that like, like I'm, I'm haunted by this thought that like, maybe it would be easier if I just could, you know, be more executive brained or, you know, just be and able to calculate maybe more quickly. I feel like there are people who can assess situations faster than I can and can make shrewd decisions or have a knack for that. Um, and I feel like Tessa might be one of them. <laughs> yeah. But, but inside deep down, I think she is probably one of them, but I think that as you can see, it doesn't necessarily lead to happiness mm. or peace of mind. So speaking of happiness and peace of mind, mm -hmm. you know, we've touched on Charlie, but I feel like Charlie is very much a central character, kind of the pivotal character in some ways in this book, because he is the, it's like this, this philosophical, uh, what's the word, like jousting or philosophical back and forth, you mm -hmm. know, and he is her sparring partner. That's what I was right. looking for. Right. And he's also maybe the person in the other marriage who is most like the mirror image maybe of Tessa. He's not entirely happy. I, I think he's feels a little bit trapped both by the marriage and by fatherhood and has a tendency like Tessa, I think, to intellectualize that and to philosophize it. And they're trying to sort things out for themselves through each other. <laughs> uh, is that a fair assessment? Abs yes, it is. Yeah. And then you have Milton who seems like a nice guy, does well for himself, but isn't maybe as engaged at that level. I mean, I think that's what Charlie is satisfying in Tessa is this need she has or this desire she has to want to dive into this stuff. And now she's got this guy who's handsome and uh, really nice and successful who can go toe to toe with her. Um, but Milton is interesting because he's sort of into Charlie too but maybe with a lesser degree of intensity. And um, I don't know, I guess like the, the Charlie character is representative of, I mean, if we've gotten into Tessa as this sort of person who's got these fixed ideas about morality, where does that put Charlie on the spectrum? Do you know what I'm saying? And how does his, his identity, his gender, how does that maybe factor into the equation? Hmm. Well, that's a lot, but yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. I mean, I think that to back up for a second and think about Milton and Tessa, in some ways, they are the opposite of the gender stereotypes where, you know, she is this person who's more, has always been more suffocated by the domestic sphere, um, more assertive, um, committed to her own sort of self-interest. Um, and as we've talked about, more apt to, to, to even walk away from the demands of par parenthood. Whereas Milton is sort of stereotypically speaking, the perfect wife, um, meaning he serves her, he's doing the cooking, the dishes, but he also um, isn't assertive with her. He's more demure. I think that he's very um, taken up by her intellect and very respectful of her position. Um, and it's not that he's not intelligent too, it's just that's how their marriage works. Um, and yet, in spite of her own ideas about feminism and her own um, ideas about what it is to be a strong woman, in some ways, Tessa can't help but want a kind of stereotypically strong man. So she thinks she wants, she, she wants to fight against gender, these stereotypical gender ideas, she thinks. And yet she's drawn to his stereotypical masculinity. So 
you know, Charlie is um, sort of posited in the book as a character, sort of a Don Juanian type of character, exactly the kind of dude that Tessa would have theoretically a major problem with, you know, um, exactly the kind of guy who, intellectually speaking, um, morally speaking, would really upset her. Um, and yet, again, and yet she is, can't help herself but overlook that in a way, um, be seduced by it, um, maybe because of a combination of factors. She's drawn to him physically, um, but also intellectually. And there's this like erotic charge between them as you're saying yeah and i think like part of the the drive of the narrative like what keeps you turning pages is wondering what's going to happen there um you know i don't want to spoil too much but it's also like learning the fate of what happens um between them all to wah, all that kind of stuff another thing that i took note of is the fact that the book is addressed to you to you like tessa is writing this book to someone and you don't know who that is until the end and i love that i thought i was like wow that's a great device you know where that's almost like a mystery it's like there's like a mysterious aspect to it um and it helps to bring everything into focus when you get to the the reveal uh is that something that you were stealing from from another book that you might have liked or you know what i'm saying like what i'm curious to know where in the process the decision to do that arrived for you um hmm. well uh, as far as the i knew that the book needed to be pretty short and propulsive um because i felt like readers would only be able to tolerate being in tessa's voice for so long and she was so kind of heady and the themes that I wanted to bring in were so heady that I wanted the story itself again, to have a certain almost like slightly thriller, like propulsion to it. Um, another layer of intrigue, as you were mentioning was like, who is this you that she's telling the story to um, actually fairly early on, I think maybe even before I started writing, I knew who I wanted her to be telling the story to. And I knew I wanted it to be someone that we were really never going to meet in the story until the end. Um, and that it should be someone who was sort of the kind of figure who Tessa herself in her up to here in this point in her life would never encounter take seriously, um, want to interact with or, or, or reveal herself to. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm but no, I, I hear you. I'm just, but like what I'm thinking now is like, yeah. it's an interesting choice and it's so hard to talk around it. Cause I don't want to spoil it. I know, <laughs> I, I know. Uh, but it's like, it, I guess what I would say is that it brings the spiritual mm -hmm. into question mm -hmm. in a way that uh, surprised me pleasantly. And it adds a dimension to the book and maybe to the questions at the heart of it, you know, which are so intellectual, I think, in the voice and through the eyes of Tessa. And to have her maybe confronting things at that level a little bit added something yeah. and I didn't, I didn't see it coming like, you know, which I think is probably the point. I mean, I think ultimately the book is as mentioned is so much about, um, well, let me back up for a second and say that I think the word empathy has become such a bad word in our, and certainly in literary circles, but I feel like even more broadly, I mentioned having gone to six different therapists and one of them, the same one who told me, you're not going to like this, but you're submissive. She said, don't say the word empathy to me. Cause I said the word empathy. She's like, don't say that word. I hate that word. I'm like, this is a therapist. <laughs> and, you know, I think that, um, 
related to this, and I'll get back to, to what we're talking about with about the spiritual, but related to this, there has been, I don't know, in the last 10 years or, or so in, in, in the literary circles and fiction, a kind of distrust of empathy and a, a, a related distrust of the enterprise of making up characters and presuming that we could possibly like know what they're thinking or um, because it's a not reality based and not be not based on our own experience. It's sort of, there's a whiff of appropriation there, right? And that uh, doing violence to others and and, um, that is not responsible somehow. Um, and I and I really do feel like this is related to again this um, broader cultural distrust of the possibility of actual empathy, as if it's a bad word. Um, so it's no accident that I think that 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 we're distrusting empathy at the very moment where we're we're more wedded to justice than to forgiveness. We're more wedded to kind of cleansing things than we are to kind of, let's say, um, I don't know, resilience even. Um, And so in what you're talking about, the figure of the you and, and, and and the spiritual dimension of the book, I knew I had to bring that in because the book was about this battle between um, correctness, justice, and, and mercy. And, you know, I didn't mean for, to say that one should always be merciful (laughs) and that, that there's not times when some, you know, that's not what I'm saying, but just, I think it has to be someone like Tessa needed to have, that thrown in her face because ultimately she needs to be forgiven too. Yeah, no, I thought, I thought it was like right on. It was one of those things where once I realized that I was like, Oh, uh, I was very happy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And it made sense, you know, it made sense, Mm -hmm. but I didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. And I guess like, you know, we talked about your personal experiences that sort of fed into the writing of this book and the backdrop against which all this, you know, personal tumult, but also just like the era that we've lived through, the pandemic, the politics, the craziness, like it's been a weird few years for everybody one way or another. I'm wondering, like spiritually, (laughs) how you might make sense of the world of the world. I ask this of authors, I used to ask it all the time, but I think it's such a fundamental question that doesn't get asked often enough. Hmm. Um, I think maybe in writerly or scholarly circles, it can sometimes be a tendency to want to sort of brush that stuff off or to kind of look at things solely through the intellect. But we all come to times in life, I think one way or another, if we live long enough, where we come up against things that might surpass our ability to intellectualize them. And we might need some kind of spiritual understanding. Like, do you agree? Like, how do you, how do you function in that way in the world? It's sort of the center of my whole being. It always has been since I've been very little. And I think that, and what do I mean by that? If I'm going to be honest, when I was little, like five, six, seven, and my parents didn't even know about this, who knows why I was like this, but I would pray every night to be overflowing with love. Don't know why I had that instinct. Don't know why I, my parents did not teach me to be this way. I, I, we were not church going except for sporadically. Um, but I think that I've thought a lot in, in my life about like how that set me up for a lot of heartache. And also to be sort of taken advantage of a lot. Wait, wait, but like what set you up? Not having... A spiritual no, no, education or no. the, the, the praying? Praying to ha- be overflowing with love, <laughs> specifically. <laughs> because when you're that committed from a very early age to 
choosing love first. Um, you can seem weak. You can seem like you're someone who's willing to be taken advantage of. You can seem um, like you don't have your fists up. And, and you don't have your fists up in the same way that so many people do. And, um, you know, so I, I think with this book, I was thinking a lot about, well, sort of like you were saying, like, um, has this all been a mistake going through life this way? This being my central value, love, um, or in fact, must I, should I just accept this is me and maybe it's even my strength. It's sort of my thing and it's okay. And maybe it means I'm more likely to be taken advantage of, you know, or, or maybe less outwardly successful than I might be or um, more forgiving. And therefore, perhaps even look to some people like an insult to women. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, I mean, I think that I was wrestling with all of that as I was writing the book. Yeah, you could definitely feel that as a reader and it forces the reader into that kind of reckoning as well. And, you know, something that you've been touching on throughout the conversation has to do with what I keep calling the gray zone and how, you know, fiction is kind of a safe space to explore these ideas and these different characters and these different perspectives and to kind of test them out against one another. And it was it's making me think of something I just read in Vanity Fair magazine, <laughs> which uh, I always read the Proust questionnaire at the back of Vanity Fair. I don't know if you're familiar with this, like the last yeah. page where like they have a famous person answer the Proust questionnaire. And George Saunders did it. And I think one of the questions was like, who do you hate the most? Or who do you despise? And he's like, I am professionally uh, somebody who writes fiction, which is the art of practicing not to hate anybody. Yeah. Something to that effect. And I loved mm -hmm. that. I was like, yeah, right. like I think anybody who's doing this work and getting inside the skin of different characters and really just slowing down and taking a look at people or even just taking a look at yourself, you can't help but find yourself in the gray zone where you don't hate or fully love them right. all the time or in some sort of really clear way. You know, you're able to kind of see the nuance and the ugliness and the beauty of them. Exactly. I mean, I was really aware of that, exactly what you're describing when I was writing Tessa, because I was like, okay, the last thing I want to do is to, I mean, I'm not interested in hating her as I write her. Um, in fact, I, I'm, my job, my task is to love her, which doesn't mean liking everything she's saying, liking everything she's done, liking how she treats people. But it means that I have to like come to the work um, with actually with, with, with an open heart toward her. Um, so I, I, and I, and honestly, it was the hardest time I've ever had as a fiction writer with a character. It cha she challenged me the most. That, that that makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> that makes per I'm glad to hear you say that actually because it makes it make sense. She's a tough she's a tough cookie, mm -hmm. especially for somebody who spent her childhood praying every night that she would be overflowing <laughs> with love. <laughs> <laughs> You know? I never saw that coming. That I was going to admit that, but okay. Uh, do you still do that? <laughs> no. Uh, well, I mean. I still have a relationship to prayer and meditation, but um, I, that that mantra that was the mantra of my childhood and that lasted until I was a young adolescent um, is no longer the the thing. There's something else. I think because it's just in me, you know. Yeah, you did it. You got it. You did your 15 <laughs> years. You got it. It's embedded in your psyche it's at this point. Pretty embedded. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this is one of those books that I will be thinking about truly for a while. It stays with you. Mm. And it's, uh, these are not easily resolved questions that it's posing. And 
I don't know. It strikes a nerve. It struck a nerve with me. I think anybody maybe who's at this stage of life or who's raising children, you know, it obviously speaks to all of those experiences, which I'm right in the middle of. And I'm wondering, given what we've been talking about, what the writing of this book did or did not deliver to you in terms of any kind of resolution. I know you're never going to get perfectly gift wrapped answers or that you're going to come to the end of a novel and be like, well, I solved that. But did it satisfy something uh, for you that was really bothering you? Like, do you feel like you made your way through to a deeper, better understanding and that you can now move forward maybe with less drag or sense of unresolvedness? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I think I have two answers to that question. On the one, one answer is sort of more of a, of a um, I guess, the satisfaction of, of so, so I, I, I told you when I started to think about the book um, during those years when I was restoring the house and Me Too was starting up and, and I was so overwhelmed with teaching and parenting and what was going on in our family that I could only take notes and for a couple of years. And so part of the satisfaction is figuring out how all of these things were related because I didn't know, like, how are all these things actually related to each other? And so the figuring out that they all had to do with love versus justice, that wasn't immediately apparent to me that these, that these, these various things all came down to that question. So at some level, um, just giving shape, a small shape to this constellation of issues that I think all of us who are at this stage in our lives are, and living here in this world, this culture at this time, are thinking about, figuring out for myself how they related to each other and what I could say about that was was... I don't know if it, it helped me answer any questions about how to proceed, but it gave me a lot of relief to, to get to find a form and a shape. Um, I also think just on a more personal level, you know, I was writing about marriage, about parenting, and I had some anxiety about if my partner, my husband, who I've been with for 26 years, if I was... Um, I didn't want to do damage there. You know, I, I wanted it to be actually the opposite. Um, and so I feel really fortunate that he's sort of like the gold standard of the artistic spouse where he, after he read the first few chapters and was like, keep going. Um, and then became a great editor of the work and really got what I was doing. And I feel like just at a personal level, the book was sort of a vehicle for some of my, not just instinct for love, but, but anger, you know, it was a way to kind of like put my upset at a lot of these things, what I went through as a mom and, a um, in the wake of the fire and culturally what we're going through and, um, what I was going through in the marriage. Um, you know, Charlie's not my husband. I'm not Wa at all. And I would never want people to think that. I kind of think of this actually as the opposite of a work of autofiction. But still, like the emotion there is 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 very close. And I I think that having the permission to to get it all out there and you know, the emotion and give it some sort of aesthetic shape. And having the support of my spouse with all that has also been an unexpected gift. Wow. Oh, well, that's really, I think one of the, one of the functions of making art, right. Is to take the stuff that we're going through and to find a form in which we can kind of say the unsaid or say the unsayable, uh, find kind of like a repository for these difficult emotions that you can't maybe act out or perform like in the pickup line at school or, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, it's just the day to day, there's no place for it, you know? And yeah. so I think like, I always 
I don't want to cause listeners to cringe because I know sometimes when writers start talking about the therapeutic benefits of writing, people can sort of eye roll, you know, but mm -hmm. I do, I feel like there is some of that. If the work itself really means something to you deeply and you're working from a really deep place, how could it not? I've never mm -hmm. been able to get how like people could write an entire novel and not derive some therapeutic benefit of some kind. Just making art in general is good for the soul, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, whether you, you understand expli you know, explicitly why and it's really defined for you or whether you just sort of feel better afterwards for reasons you can't fully explain. Yeah, and I think there's something therapeutic in taking something that feels like personal and, and it only pertains to you and then just sort of kind of going way past the personal into, into the human and the cultural for me, it was a way to to actually leave behind our little story and comment on something bigger and make something make something out of it that would actually hopefully be speak to more people than just us. All right. Well, I'm I've got to believe. I know you've had probably friends read it, and I'm sure you're starting to get reader responses. But it's early in the game with this book because yeah. it's just about to publish. Uh, a, have you heard from people, especially people you don't know? And then if not, I'm just going to be, I would love to hear at some point what the response is like out on book tour and what people, because I just have a feeling you're going to hear interesting things. I think it's going to activate people and it's going to cause them to like ramble at you as I have been doing, <laughs> <laughs> trying to like sort it out. You know, it's like, it's get, it has an odd effect on the reader that distinguishes it. And that's a, a compliment to you and to the, like the rigor of the deep thinking that you're doing in this book and the way that you found a way to explore these philosophical conundrums and human difficulties through this particular set of characters in a very, like you said, confined space. This is not a long book, uh, and yet there's so much in it. And I love books like that. A, because I have to read like two books a week, so I'm always like, yay. <laughs> but, <you> know, <laughs> this one I can, I can get through, you know, but uh, without having to like read into the night. But it, it doesn't mean that, uh, that it's, you know, in any way like breezy. There's a lot, of, mm -hmm. a lot happening. Did you write like lots of pages that got cut? I'm wondering. I always wonder how people get to these like really efficient uh, novels. D did you like well, overwrite you know, it and then bring it back or did you just go slowly? <laughs> you know, my last, my, my two previous books are like really long, um, 500 page manuscript type books, dense. And I, I knew with this one, I knew I wanted it to be short because a variety of things some I mentioned but one I haven't mentioned is just that like like you I I really I I just love shorter books um it's what I could do during the pandemic I think everyone's attention span was less in the beginning at least and so I had this idea in my head fairly early on that the perfect length for a novel was like 50,000 words and I was like okay how can I structure the whole book to be 50,000 words? It's not like I went and I wrote an outline. I didn't, but I think that when you tell your, it's sort of like an intention. Like I went into writing the book with the intention of writing something between 45,000 and 50,000 words. Um, and so I, it, it's not that things weren't cut. I did cut some material, um, after I'd sold the book, when, when I got feedback from my editor, um, but it was only like 3000 words that I cut. Oh, wow. Um, so, I mean, it was just a more laborious kind of working in miniature from the beginning. Yeah. Well, it's a lovely book. Congratulations on getting it done, you know, enduring and, and doing the work and making sense of tough questions for the rest of us. And I always ask people at the end, if they're working on anything new, it is okay if you are not, if you're just enjoying this one, but is there anything else in the pipeline? Yes, I am presently starting to work on what I hope will be um, actually three novels. The first novel being the one, my nemesis that I that we've just discussed. Um, and then two more short, 
books that touch on contemporary life and women's issues and like women's relationships with one another. So the next book will be in some ways thematically related, but with different characters. Ooh. So it's like, could be like a trilogy, thematic kind of, trilogy. Yeah, I see them as just being speaking to one another. Interesting. Well, we'll keep uh, our eyes peeled. Congratulations again. Thank and you. thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you. It was really fun.